And welcome everyone to the webinar. Before we start, I just wanted to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country and pay our respects to those who've cared and continue to care for country. And then I want to introduce Tracy Lee Lava. So Tracy is an associate professor with the Centre for Health Economics Research and Evaluation, best known as SHARE at the University of Technology in Sydney, and is also an NHMRC Early Career Sydney Sachs Fellow and a registered pharmacist. So over the last 10 years, um, Tracy's really used sort of an health economics, drug utilization and policy lens in her research. And she's developed this really vibrant research program that aims to improve health, especially among disadvantaged populations and primarily through better using high value medicines for non-communicable diseases. So Tracy is relatively new at SHARE and before that she was a senior research fellow at the George Institute for Global Health, um, UNSW and at the Menzies Centre for Health Policy at the University of Sydney. And she also held an honorary postdoctoral research fellow appointment at the University of British Columbia in Canada, which is where we met and where she spent two years establishing ongoing collaborations with a really lovely group um, of leading health economists and pharmacoepidemiologists. So as Sarah mentioned, Tracy will present now for about half an hour. If you've got any questions as you go through or you have technical difficulties, feel free just to use the chat function and um, I'll answer your questions, but we'll hold over questions about content and clarification until the end. And then um, you can use the same chat function or question function to ask any questions and I'll translate them through to Tracy and we can have a discussion that way. So thank you, Tracy. All right, thanks, Alison. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so um, thanks everyone for dialing in today or listening to this later on. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about a, a project that we did. It was a rather large project. Um, that was an NHMRC partnership project, and it's really trying to tap, tap into what the cost of medicines or how the cost of medicines to patients were potentially influencing their use of guidelines-based medicines for their asthma in Australia. Got to start with my conflict of interest. Uh, my married name is Lava, <laughs> and I will be talking about a group of drugs today which are abbreviated to LAVAs. It's a cruel twist of fate. I'm not advocating for them, and I'm certainly not getting any kickbacks about them, but please feel free to have a chuckle, because I certainly do every time I, I talk about this subject. All right, so as I mentioned, it was an NHMRC partnership project. and was really trying to ultimately evaluate whether a financial incentive could improve the use of preventive medicines by people with asthma. It was a collaboration between a number of different research organisations, um, as well as the National Prescribing Service, uh, Asthma Australia. But we also had a number of other stakeholders that we consulted throughout the, the, the um, life of the project. Notably, Consumer Health Forum, the Department of Health, a number of health practitioners, including GPs and pharmacists, as well as the Pharmacy Guild of Australia and the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia. So it was quite a broad reaching and scoping project. It's quite fun. So the reason for this project um, was really based on three main issues that were identified, um, and I'll talk to each of those now a bit more. So firstly, asthma in Australia, if we were to have the chronic disease Olympics, we would probably come out near on top in terms of asthma. So currently one in nine people are affected by asthma. Um, we have tons of hospitalisations still going on and they're more likely in children less than 15 years. It really interferes a lot with people's daily lives. Um, it in interferes with their ability to work or go to school. Um, and even though we know there's some really good interventions out there, such as asthma action plans, which are essentially telling people what to do if they're having an exacerbation of their disease, we have some data which has shown that not all people are getting them, even though they really need these asthma action plans. We spend a lot of money on asthma um, and we're still getting a number of deaths. Um, even though the rates of deaths seem to be quite steady over the last few years and even potentially declining in people aged 5 to 34 years, most of these deaths are considered preventable and so we feel there's a lot more that can be done. So just in terms of what asthma is, um, it is a chronic disease. It's a chronic inflammatory disease of the airways. For the most 
people, it doesn't go away. It will bubble along and get worse. And what tends to happen is that there will be these exacerbations in their asthma and they will lead to shortness of breath, inability to breathe, and then eventually possibly needing some urgent healthcare use because of that. Um, and so what we're really trying to do is to get on top of that inflammation and not just try and open up the airways and help them breathe. We're trying to do both. So there's a number of different strategies that can help reduce the exacerbations and help people live a more um, reasonable life with their disease. Um, and one of the key foundations of treating asthma are medicines. And I've put this diagram up on this slide to just demonstrate that there is a plethora of different types of medicines, but more specifically, the types of devices of the same medicine. And it's really can be, this in itself, it can be quite complicated for patients with asthma because they need to have different techniques in using these devices. So our view is that we know that there are these barriers that are potentially overcomable and we really want to be trying to remove what we can in terms of allowing people to access their, medic their, their medicines. So to simplify what these medicines are doing, um, for today's presentation, I'm really just focusing on two broad types. So relievers, which are, we probably may know them more so as the blue inhaler, so our Ventolins. And these are known as short acting beta agonists. And essentially what these do is when people are having, with asthma are having an attack, you, they use their reliever and it quickly opens up their airways and allows them to breathe. Um, it's a bit of a band-aid effect though because it's not really doing anything to the underlying inflammation that's ultimately causing these exacerbations. On the other hand, there's a broader group of uh, medicines called preventers, and these typically contain corticosteroids. Um, so in terms of the preventers, these are corticosteroids and they're trying to address the underlying inflammation. So they're really the things that are, I guess, effectively treating the, the reason for why people are possibly getting exacerbations. In terms of preventers, they can either be a single agent preventer, so they only contain an inhaled corticosteroid or an ICS. And these are, um, a medication for instance would be one with fluticasone only, which is flixotide. The other um, type of preventer are what, known, are what are known as combination inhalers. And so they will have not only a corticosteroid in it, but it also has another agent in it called a long-acting beta agonist, where my name comes in. <laughs> and essentially what that extra ingredient does is, is it helps to, more slowly than a, than a Ventolin, but it helps to open up the airways for a little bit um, and then allow some of the corticosteroid to come in. Okay, so they're called ICS larvas, that's what I'll be referring to them as, as opposed to the single agents, which are ICS only medications. There's also a number of other medications, but for today's presentation, I'm really focusing more so on those um, inhaled preventers and relievers. So the key thing to note is that these uh, low-dose uh, corticosteroids are thought to be, along with other management strategies, so the asthma action plans, avoiding things that might exacerbate their asthma, such as um, environmental risks, smoking for instance, those combination of treatments are thought to be the key to preventing a lot of the asthma deaths that are going on around the world with asthma. Um, and this is because um, in the Global Burden of Disease report in 2017 noted that there was a real absence of relationship between asthma deaths and prevalence. And this is thought to to be because a lot of these deaths are actually preventable by using low-dose corticosteroids. So in Australia, and these guidelines have changed since we did this study a little bit, and I will explain what the difference is in the next slide. But essentially in terms of how these medicines are meant to be used, it's in a stepped approach. So at the time of the study, everyone was thought to have needed a short-acting beta agonist, so a, a reliever. But for the majority of patients, a low-dose um, preventer, a low-dose corticosteroid, ICS-only medication was considered the mainstay of treatment. If, however, exacerbations occur while having these low-dose uh, corticosteroids, um, then 
and adherence was checked. So whether checking whether or not they're using the device properly and they're taking it regularly. Um, if exacerbations were still occurring, then we gradually step them up, um, up the ladder. And so at step three, we might see a higher dose of ICS containing medicine used, or we might start to see a low dose combination agent used as well. Then if exacerbations are still occurring, we go up the ladder even further to go into higher doses and then eventually um, respirology referral. The key though with this is that if you see on the right hand side of that diagram is that we also want to try and step people down. So the idea is that we step up treatment to give them a higher dose, more to give them more control, but then we also then want to try and step them back down to that the lowest um, and most effective dose that's available for them. The key difference between the update in the guidelines now is that as needed um, a, a reliever on its own without any low dose corticosteroid is essentially not really recommended now for um, the majority of patients because there has been some data which shows that only using a reliever as with only using a Band-Aid is really not helping people um, control their asthma and can actually um, worsen their outcomes. So for the, the, the key message is still there that for the majority of patients, a low dose ICS only medication is, is what is required for the best control. And there's a ton of evidence that supports these guidelines, thank goodness, um, and particularly in terms of starting people on ICS alone versus starting them on a combination agent. And essentially what we've, what's been found in the literature is that there's really no benefit in starting patients on, on a combination agent um, from the outset. And in fact, it really doesn't um, translate to any better outcomes, particularly in terms of exacerbations, in terms of their ability to control their symptoms, um, but also in the, in the number of relievers that they're needing. It's really quite a, not much of a difference in terms of their effectiveness at all. So what's going on in Australia? Um, I put up an Australia versus New Zealand diagram just because we're an Australian New Zealand organisation here. <laughs> but it's actually quite interesting to compare. So this is some surveys that were done by Helen Rodell, one of the, um, my colleagues in this project. Um, and essentially what's been found is that um, in Australia and New Zealand, between 60 and 70% of um, asthma patients that were surveyed we're taking some form of ICS containing inhaler. In New Zealand, however, 44% um, of those patients were on um, an ICS larva, so a combination inhaler. And this is in stark contrast to Australia where we have roughly 82% of our patients who are taking an ICS container inhaler, having it in the form of a combination agent. Now just flip back to those last few slides where the guidelines are stating that the majority should be on ICS alone. Just an interesting little fact as well, um, anecdotally, um, from some of our colleagues, is that from the time from the launch of ICS larvas onto the Australian market, it only took three years for ICS larvas or combination agents to overtake the single agent um, ICS only inhalers. Whereas we compare that to the New Zealand market, um, it took roughly 13 years and even still if uh, looking at that data from um, Professor Rodell, it still doesn't look like it's really taken over. Um, we know there was a large marketing push for the combination agents, um, but it's still quite a curiosity to why so many people are starting on combination agents. So one query could be, well, perhaps the um, prescribing regulations are favouring, uh, it's easier to prescribe combination agents. Well, both of them uh, listed on the PBS, which is our universal medicine plan. Um, and there's really no more restrictions. Uh, in fact, there's less restrictions placed on the, on the ICS alone agents. This is because on our PBS, um, the medicines are listed relative to the evidence that's been, um, that cost effectiveness has been established on. And in fact, for the combination agents, um, the PBS was trying to mimic the guidelines and put some further prescribing constraints around when these agents could be used. So for instance, the prescribers actually are declaring that they've first of all trialled ICS alone, 
they've declared that they've um, tested and checked their adherence and their device use. And after doing those things, then they will prescribe ICS, or my, uh, ICS combination. So in fact, these restrictions aren't placed on ICS alone. So it seems that this is not a, a, a rational reason for what we're seeing in practice. Some data also showed that for those people that are getting their ICS containing medicines, that there is not regular use. And one of the key um, things to the effectiveness of these agents is they do need to be used regularly. So on this diagram, we can see that under 15% are having um, between seven to 12 ICS containing medicines dispensed per year, which would equate to regular use, so monthly use. Um, as opposed to over 35%, so almost 40% of, um, of the dispensations are occurring to people only once in the year. So this is quite concerning. At the same time, there's also been some data which has um, attested to the potential for cost being an issue for um, people using asthma medicines. So in 2005, there was a real increase of 21% in the co-payments. Um, and a study by Anna Himes um, showed that some of the medicines that appeared to reduce in their dispensations are before and after um, that co-payment rise, asthma medications were top of the list. Um, and there was another study by Ampon in the same year, which also showed that people with concession cards, so who are paying less out of pocket at the point of sale, um, were more likely to get their ICS containing medicines. And that was controlling for other contributing factors such as age and disease severity and the like. In addition to this, um, we spend a lot on asthma medication. So of the $655 million that's spent on asthma, roughly 50% of that is on prescription medicines. Um, the interesting caveat to this, and this is again at the time of the study, and it still is relevant to now, is that the cost to government for these combination agents can be up to 10 times more than, as, than the ICS alone. In terms of patients, um, this uh, table is based on some work done by the team um, in the partnership project, which was uh, published in the Australian Prescriber. And if you work out the different steps of the asthma guidelines, so remembering step two is ICS alone, then what we actually find is that if you work out the dose, based on the dose per patient per month, it's considerably less for both general patients as well as those who have some concession benefits. And this can be, you know, at step two, we're looking at the cheapest, it would be $5.93 per month um, over time, um, as opposed to at step four or even step three, where we're looking um, upwards of $20 to $40 per month. So that's considerably different. Okay, so collectively this then raised the questions in the partnership project around what, how are the costs to patients for asthma medicines impacting use in Australia? And we're particularly interested in asking people with asthma, but as well as prescribers and specifically GPs. And then ultimately what we wanted to try and test was whether a financial incentive in the form of lowering the co-payment for ICS alone agents would improve the use of these preventative medicines um, in those people. So we, it's a, quite a big body of work and I'm really gonna try and get through it pretty quickly. <laughs> um, but essentially what we've done are some qualitative interviews with GPs, adults with asthma, as well as, as, well as parents of children with asthma. And then we also did a quantitative web-based survey um, with, uh, of adults with asthma, and again, parents of children greater than four and less than 17 with asthma. In that quantitative survey, we included an indicator for cost-related underuse, which I'll explain in a few slides. But we also conducted a discrete choice experiment as a means of trying to test the potential impact of a financial incentive on use. So in terms of the qualitative results with the general practitioners, a number of different themes came out, and this has all been um, published in the Australian Health Review last year. But a few key issues I thought I'd highlight today were around the prescribing priorities, whether cost was an issue considered an issue for their patients, whether or not they're talking to their patients about costs, and also floating the idea of having, having that um, patient in, 
financial incentive. So in terms of their prescribing decisions, it was overwhelming, um, overwhelmingly consistent through the data that the effectiveness of the medicine relevant for their particular patient is what was dominating their prescribing decisions. Um, and really trying to uh, test for whether the medicines that they're prescribing are working. They all said that they prescribed according to guidelines, but when we dug a little deeper, really only two of them used ICS only as their initial treatment. And they also, while they were supportive of savings, considering savings to government, they certainly weren't prepared to prioritise that at the expense of what they considered the best patient care. In terms of whether cost was an issue to their patients with asthma, all but the three GPs said that, they real, that their patients rarely reported cost as an issue. Um, only three GPs reported that costs were a problem for some of their um, patients for their medicines, but not just for asthma. So that was a general um, issue. And the way that they responded to this was by really reviewing the patient's entire treatment regimen and trying to focus on what they thought was the most expensive, but they really didn't have an idea of what the exact costs were to their patients. There seemed to be relatively little awareness of what the co-payments were, and there's certainly no education provided formally to them. It was one GP um, said that it's not really something that they ever discuss with drug reps. And even if they did try to ask them that, it was a really vague answer. And so the way that they found out about co-payments was really by cobbling pieces of information together from their colleagues and, and possibly pharmacists. In terms of whether they discussed um, medicine costs with their asthma patients, initiating those discussions was not um, apparently done. Um, they said that they might have discussed it if the patient was um, nominating it, so initiating that, con that conversation. Um, and also, they also a couple of the GPs thought that it really wasn't their position to discuss medicine costs. And in fact, one GP nominated that if they thought that a person needed a particular medication, then that's the one that they need to give without really considering the patient costs. In terms of floating the idea of lowering the co-payment, um, there was one GP who treated many patients with cost concerns and thought that this might have been an appropriate strategy if it could guarantee the effectiveness of that uh, medicine that has the lower co-payment. But uh, otherwise, it was generally thought that this might not be worthwhile from a time perspective because they are time poor and the notion of having to fiddle around with medications that they're already apparently working on um, would be more of a pain and not really worth it. In terms of the patients, there were certainly mixed and varied perceptions around the cost of medicines, ranging from people who would uh, who nominated that if it's too expensive, then they certainly, and they can't afford it for other reasons, then they would go without it for a few months until their symptoms got noticeably worse. As opposed to some parents of children who would basically spend every last penny on their kid's weight, on their kid's medicine to make them healthy. One interesting finding was the notion that um, the cost of not taking the medicine was considered. So obviously they will try to pay for their medicines because the implications of not taking their medicines seemed a lot more in terms of missing out on work and other productivity losses. Um, interestingly, and this really reflected what some of the stakeholders were saying in the project, is that many of the um, patients were unaware of what the cost of their medicine was going to be until they got into the pharmacy. Um, and I guess in some ways, we, for some, that might be seen as a bit of bill shock in some ways. Okay, so I'll quickly move on to the quantitative results um, and specifically looking at how cost was um, potentially impacting medicine use. Um, so the cohort, I just put a snapshot of the baseline char or the characteristics of our cohort. Um, or I'm sorry, it's a cross section, so of our group. Um, and I think the thing that I really wanted to point out here is that we had a group who were over well, almost a third of the adults and um, just over a third of ch the children with asthma would have been classified as having poorly controlled asthma symptoms in the four weeks prior to the survey. Um, and over the previous 12 months, 44% um, 
0.6% um, and almost two thirds of children with asthma had either seen a GP or have been to the hospital because of um, their asthma. And 41% of the adults and 53% of the children with asthma had not used an ICS containing medicine in the previous 12 months. And I find those figures quite alarming in themselves. So as I mentioned, we did have an indicator for cost-related underuse of, of their asthma medicines. And this is not just preventers, this is also asking about relievers as well. Um, and we asked their recall period in the previous 12 months. And this is essentially asking them whether they either skipped or reduced doses, delayed getting a prescription or simply didn't get the prescription because specifically, or specifically because of cost. So we're not just looking at general adherence, we're looking at reasons for doing the, the reason for doing this is because of cost. And this indicator was previously used, it's been validated in other studies and is used in the Medicare beneficiary survey in the States. So I had to check these figures a lot because I was quite surprised at the, the rates of them. Uh, so what we found that any of those cost-related underuse behaviours in adults was occurring in over 50% of adults and in roughly a third of children um, with asthma. For the adults, where the predominant behaviours were really taking smaller doses or skipping doses because of cost, so to try and stretch their medicine out for longer. Um, but for the children, it was really in turn, it, all of those behaviours were roughly equivalent. So not only taking smaller doses, skipping doses, but also delaying or not getting prescriptions because of cost. When we looked into the literature, uh, there really weren't a number, a lot of studies out there that specifically focused on people with asthma. There was one study conducted in the US and only in people 50 years and over. So we cut our data back um, to, to compare our results. And what we found was that 20%, uh, compared to the 20% that was reported in the state, state, in the United States, ours was up near 40% for their similar age group. Um, and then there was one other study which also um, was conducted in the States, but only in people over 65 years and over, and our rates were roughly equivalent. So this suggests that age is, is, a, is an important factor because our study um, spanned the whole range of adulthood as well as looking at children. Um, and so what this is suggesting is those younger age um, people are potentially more at risk or are more likely to report cost-related underuse. And that was really well reflected in, our, um, in the modelling that we did. Um, and so we did find that relationship between age. The thing that I really wanted to highlight in our modelling that we found was that we also included a question around how comfortable people were discussing either changing their medications or talking about co the cost of their medicines with their doctor. And what we found was that the more comfortable people were discussing um, their medicines in for their adults, the less likely they were to report cost-related underuse. Um, similarly, for the parents of children with asthma, what we found was if they were more comfortable talking about medication costs, or if they felt more involved with their making decisions about medicines for their children with their doctor, then they were again less likely to report cost-related underuse. What is striking for, for, to us as well for both of these um, modelling, even though we've controlled for concession card status, um, it really wasn't a significant um, associated factor in either of our studies, in either of the models, sorry. So just quickly, how am I going? All right. <laughs> so just now quickly, um, dipping over into the discrete choice experiment. And so this is where we were really trying to experimentally model what would potentially happen if we were to lower the co-payment for the ICS alone inhalers. Um, so discrete choice experiment, um, for those who are not familiar with it, essentially it's a survey where we pose a series of hypothetical choices and people make a series of choices and we try based on a number of factors and we then try to work out what we can work out what might be important when people are making particular decisions. Um, so in this particular study, we were trying to work out, well, how important is out-of-pocket costs on the choice of preventers when people are making a choice between ICS alone versus a combination agent? 
Then, of course, if we were to lower the co-payment for ICS alone, would we see an increased uptake? Um, so would more people choose the ICS alone inhalers? And then we also wanted to try and model that out in a financial model to see what that might mean for government expenditure. So in a nutshell, the scenario we proposed was a choice between ICS alone versus the combination agents. Um, we proposed that these were a preventer was recommended to them by their GP. We also proposed that um, for this scenario that the ICS alone and ICS level were considered equivalent in terms of safety and effectiveness. And we also gave them the option to opt out. So they didn't have to choose a preventer. They could say, I don't want to use a preventer. In terms of what we were looking at, so the factors that were considered important to the decision, which were taken from the qualitative work, um, we looked at the symptom frequency at the point of the appointment, um, the chance of needing to go back and see the doctor to fiddle around with the, the medicines, the strength of the inhaler, the cost to government, and then the out-of-pocket cost. So in a nutshell, what we found was that out-of-pocket costs were certainly an important and significantly important factor to respondent choice when they were making choices between inhalers. When we put in the current co-payment levels for the inhalers, what we found was that there were a higher, much higher proportion that were willing to choose a preventer compared to what we're currently seeing in our dispensing data. We also found that there was a higher uptake of ICS alone inhalers versus the ICS uh, combination agents. And if we modelled that out, we found that it would be a lower cost per patient uh, to the government. So $32.73 versus $38.54 to the government per patient. When we went on to simulate what would happen if we lowered the copayment for ICS alone only, if we decreased the copayment by 50%, then we only saw a march, a really small shift in the market share from 47% to 50%. We, when we went further and completely removed that co-payment, there was really not much more um, uptake in the market shares. And in fact, the cost to government went higher. And this was in part because we were assuming that the government, well, government was absorbing the cost of the co-payment, the reduced co-payment. So bringing it all together, I've gone through quite a lot in a short space of time, but what we're finding is that despite PBS subsidies, where people, uh, the government is subsidising a large part of the cost of um, these medicines to asthma patients, we're finding that cost-related underuse of asthma medicines is actually quite common in Australia. Um, we're particularly common amongst younger males, but what we're, we've got a sniff of evidence that involving patients and parents of children with asthma as well in decisions about their medicines and working on increasing their comfortability with discussing costs and medicine changes might be a, a way in to minimising this cost-related underuse. We also found that few clinicians appear to be discussing cost with their patients and most of them seem to be unaware of the potential issues that out-of-pocket costs are um, causing to their patients in terms of medicine use. From our modelling, we also, uh, it seems to indicate that the current levels of preventer use are not reflecting what patients would be willing to use in practice. And so that hints to maybe we need better and more systematic ways of incorporating patient preferences at the point of prescribing. So in terms of where we think we can go with this, I think critically we think that there needs to be a dialogue raised quite critically about the impact of costs on asthma medicine use. And this conversation can happen between prescribers and patients um, and particularly with pharmacists, which we get a, a, some evidence that that's already happening. So maybe we need to try and augment that conversation and bring the prescribers into it as well. Um, as I mentioned, there are already some uh, financial incentives um, by you following the guidelines um, to patients, and there are some lower out-of-pocket cost options available. And so potentially if we just use those, um, we might see an uptake, um, an increased uptake in preventer use. Um, but from all of our work, it doesn't seem to us that an additional patient-directed financial incentive in the form of lowering the co-payment for ICS alone 
is really going to do much in terms of shifting preventer use once the preventers have been prescribed. Um, and I think that's probably where we're at. We've already got financial incentives in the market and so we need to try and find ways to um, leverage those. All right, that was a lot to cover. <laughs> um, but thank you for listening and um, yeah, happy to get some questions. That was great. Thank you so much, Tracy. That was super interesting. Um, and we've got a couple of questions come through as you were talking. So um, if anyone has any other questions, please feel free just to use the Q&A um, button at the bottom of your screen. It, it hides itself if you're inactive. So if you just move your mouse over the screen, it should pop up and you can type your question in there. But in the meantime, um, Nadine had a question about the qualitative work that you did where you interviewed the GPs and the patients. Um, and she was wondering whether instead of or as well as interviewing the GPs, you considered interviewing pharmacists because obviously they also have a role in the um, when a prescription is filled, which particular medication is, is given. Yeah, that's a really great point. Thanks, Nadine. Um, it's something that was floated, but um, we didn't go down that path. But I think certainly it's something that um, we need to do. Um, there's some ongoing work as a, um, um, as a consequence of this program of work, which is now looking at how we can um, facilitate those conversations and I guess more standardise those conversations that are already happening at the level of the, the pharmacy. Um, I think one of the key things which I didn't highlight too much in this presentation as well, is that one of the key things that came out of both the patient and the uh, prescriber interviews is that there's that real sense of a gatekeeping role of the prescribers in terms of decision making around these medicines and that kind of makes sense because they've got all the expertise in making that initial recommendation um, but without a doubt whilst there's that initial prescription there's no reason why I don't think why the preferences of patients could still be incorporated more systematically at that point of prescribing. Um, and similarly, if we really think about it, if people aren't using it once it's been, you know, once they've got the prescription and left the GP surgery, then they are actually effectively making a choice to buy in or not to buy into those agents. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to happen and we feel that sort of interventions directed at the prescriber level, but certainly without a doubt, trying to incorporate what the pharmacist is already doing and facing in their pharmacy is, is the way forward. But yeah, absolutely something that we, we um, I think more work needs to be done in that area. Yeah, and you can imagine too that if um, people are stretching out their prescriptions or skipping doses or taking a lower dose to try and reduce the cost overall of their medications and pharmacists potentially have a really important role in education around what the potential impacts of that are and the, um, <clears throat> the, the potential benefits and risks that they face by doing that and what other strategies there might be as well. So I think you're right that it's not just doctors and patients, it's the whole sort of healthcare system. Yeah, for sure. Um, so then there's another and submitted two questions which are kind of similar, so I'm going to combine them. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one is that obviously it's really interesting that GPs aren't happy discussing cost of medicines with patients or some GPs feel uncomfortable doing that. Did you have any data about why they felt uncomfortable or what the barriers were that they um, felt they were facing? And do you have any suggestions for how you could address that? Yeah, I don't recall the reasons why, other than um, in their mind, their role is to ensure quality of care and ensure that the medicine that they're prescribing is the most effective for their patients. And that's really what's dominating their decision. But I think for me, you're only going to get that effectiveness if they're going to be able to take it, right? So I think there's a, a little bit of, we need to decouple that a little bit or recouple it. I'm not sure which way we want to do that. But um, yeah, I think, I, I think as well what is poten I potentially didn't explain well enough as, or what we haven't contextualised is that they are time poor, right? In the way that they're seeing, I, I don't want to 
I don't want to say, I don't like to use that as an excuse, and I certainly don't want to be seen as saying that, but it's, it's the reality is that they are time poor. They've got very little time to see their patients. And so in some ways they are prioritising what they need to talk about. And I think perhaps they don't feel that they're, it's within their training to be talking about um, costs, but it could also potentially be, well, what do we do about it? And they don't really know what the solution is. So maybe it's better not to, to go there. But um, from the data that we've, I mean, that's me hypothesising, from the data that we've got, it was certainly more that it's just not their priority because what they're focusing on is making sure what they're prescribing is right for that patient in terms of effectiveness. Okay, that's really interesting. Um, and then Anne had another question, which was around the work you did on out-of-pocket costs that um, people with asthma were facing. And she was just wondering what you included in your measure of out-of-pocket costs. So was it just sort of the gap payment for medications or did you also include other things like um, time and cost to attend a GP visit or time off work and things like that? So was this for the cost-related underuse question or is this for the DCE? Uh, I'm not sure, Anne, if you were to um, type that in. Yeah, I, I can stab at both. <laughs> um, so in terms of the, um, in terms of the financial modelling, maybe, um, so for the DCE stuff, we really only included pharmaceutical costs. So we weren't looking at broader costs. Um, in terms of the cost for going back to the GP. Um, and that was a pragmatic reason in terms of the data that we had, the way that we model it um, yeah. using the DCE um, data. Um, for the quantity, for the survey of cost related underuse, it was a qualitative question, I guess. So a yes or no question. So did they reduce skip or did they reduce or skip doses because of cost or delay or not fill prescriptions? because of cost. So we didn't actually measure what the exact out-of-pocket cost was. We did have a question, questions in there about their out-of-pocket costs for medicines as well as a whole range of other um, uh, health services. Um, but the data was really patchy. People were not inclined to actually, uh, less than half were inclined to actually nominate how much they were paying out-of-pocket. And I guess it's a little bit tricky when we're looking at those because um, whether they're reporting lower out-of-pocket costs because they haven't got the ability to pay for it versus, you know what I mean? Like a little, it's a bit of a funny relationship there as well. Yeah, absolutely. That if you, if you don't have the money to buy whatever it is, then it looks like you've had no out-of-pocket costs. But if you've had the money, you, you might have had much higher out of -pocket. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, that's all of the questions that we've got at the moment. So if anyone has any... Um, other questions, please feel free to put them in now because we do have a few more minutes, but otherwise I'll just go through a couple of announcements um, to finish off. So one is to say, first of all, thank you so much to Tracy for her time and that was a super interesting presentation. So uh, I think that will be very popular. If um, you're listening to this either live or later uh, and you think of a topic that you'd like to see covered in the future, or if you go to a great presentation somewhere else and you think that members of the Health Services Research Association might be interested, then please feel free to send us through your ideas. We're always looking for um, new voices to come and be part of our webinar series, which runs approximately monthly through the year. Um, also, as Sarah mentioned, we have the conference coming up in December in Auckland, if you feel like a trip to New Zealand. Uh, that's a really great conference to target and happens every second year. And Sarah also mentioned at the beginning two programs which are currently open for applications. One is our awards program uh, for both, both best paper and investigator awards. Anyone from PhD students all the way up to lifetime achievement awards are open for nominations. It's a very straightforward, simple process. So if you know anyone that you think um, is deserving of an award, then please put their name forward. Uh, and the last thing is just to mention the mentoring program, which is also just open for applications, both for mentors and mentees. Um, I, if anyone follows me on Twitter, you'll see I highly, highly recommend this program. Uh, it's one of the best professional development opportunities that I've been involved in to date. And we're currently looking for both mentors and mentees. So if you want to apply, um, do so. But if you want to just have a chat about what's involved and whether it might be something you'd be interested in, feel free to get in touch and happy to have a chat. 
Um, so we haven't had any other questions come through. It was a very clear presentation, Tracy. So oh yeah. <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, but thanks again for your time and thank you everyone for attending. Sarah, did you want to say anything else at the end? No, I think you've covered it all. Thanks. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> thank you all. Uh, and um, thanks again, Tracy. Thanks, Alison. See ya. I'm looking for the lead meeting. <laughs>